Welcome to the lectures on evolution of air interface towards 5G. Uh, till the previous lecture, uh, we have discussed the waveform for 2G as well as have also laid the foundation for uh, the waveform structure for 4G and beyond. And we have also started discussing about the waveform for 3G. So, we will briefly conclude the air interface uh, properties that are there in the 3G and we will soon translate into the foundation for the multi carrier systems, uh, which is essential for understanding the 4G wave air interface waveforms as well as the 5G waveforms. So, what we were uh, discussing in the previous uh, lecture was essentially the transmitter structure, which we have laid down over here and uh, we talked about the modulation part, then there is the channel and the receiver part which we have identified over here and we have discussed in details how the signal which is of duration T b uh, gets multiplied by chips where each of the chip is of duration T c and uh, we talked about the expansion of the bandwidth because uh, T c is the chip duration is much much smaller than T b duration and hence uh, when we look at the rate of bit compared to the rate of the chip. So, we will find that the chip rate is much larger than the bit rate. Effectively, the signal that goes out into the air has a much larger bandwidth compared to the original bandwidth of the baseband signal for a particular user. And hence, there is an expansion of bandwidth and typically these kind of systems are known as spread spectrum communication and this is an example of direct sequence spread spectrum. We have also discussed briefly upon the codes very, very briefly upon the codes where we said there could be orthogonal codes uh, which has the property like if one uses two different codes uh, with different code indexes, then only if the code indexes are same you get the end result of summation as 1 otherwise it is 0. And we also said that there could be other ways of designing codes uh, whereby uh, this same code is used you get a very high value whereas, when other codes are used you do not get a 0, but you get a very small value that is very small cross correlation properties and very good autocorrelation properties. We have also extended the same structure towards the QPSK modulation where we said that there would be one channel uh, and another channel in 90 degrees with respect to each other by virtue of having two different uh, carriers one is the cosine one is the sine. So, that is the quadrature carriers and we have also represented a typical receiver structure. We have also discussed about the, the possible receivers we did not go into the details, but briefly outlined the way it captures multipath signal and uh, we briefly said that uh, it uses the rake receiver architecture. We do not intend to get into the details because that is a complete uh, discussion and, and a detailed uh, architecture in itself. Our intention is to go into others, uh, other models, but uh, just to know about uh, the differences that is present in the other um, systems. So, going uh, beyond whatever we have discussed, uh, there is also a method for allow allowing variable spreading factor. So, when we say variable spreading factor, what we mean is uh, if we look back into the signal model, uh, the number of chips that are available uh, during a bit period can be modified. That means, the code length in other words the code length can be varied. So, instead of having a fixed code length whereby R b uh, sorry R c by R b is constant otherwise we can have a variable factor that means, the code rate is not constant it can be a varying code rate. The only advantage that we have is that uh, in, in such a situation one can use a higher data rate. So, for example, the original codes can be uh, split I mean I mean if you have uh, one if you begin from one you can generate uh, two code sets which have the first code as 1 1 and the second code as 1 minus 1. And if you uh, see what has been happening with the previous discussion uh, at the receiver side if we correlate with two different codes as we were discussing we get a 1 multiplied by 1 and 1 multiplied by minus 1. So, 1 multiplied by 1 is 1, 1 multiplied by minus 1 is minus 1. When we add together, if we add them together, you are going to get a 0. Whereas, if, if this was your original code and you multiplied by the same code that means, uh, plus 1 and minus 1, your multiplication would result in a 1, here it would also result in a 1 and if you sum them it would result in 2 which you could normalize by the number of chips. 
So essentially if it is the same code you get a 1 otherwise you get a 0. So here now what we are discussing is that instead of using a code length of 2 right which is uh, described over here that means uh, as given over here instead of using code length of 2 if we use code length of 1 what happens is that the bit duration is the same as the chip duration. So, if chip duration is my uh, fundamental entity in that case my bit rate is as good as the chip rate. Whereas, if I use a code rate of 2, my bit rate becomes half that of the chip rate. So, proceeding further, this particular code can be split again into a code of 1, 1, 1, 1 and 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. So, once again what you see is that if we correlate these two codes, that means multiply the chips against each other, for the first we are going to get 1, for the second we are going to get 1 for the third we are going to get a minus 1, the fourth we are going to get a minus 1. So, when you add up all of them you get a 0, whereas if you correlate with the same code once again you get a 1, a 1, a 1 and a 1 and when you add up together you get a 4 normalized by the number of chips you are going to get the end result as 1. So, that means once again cross correlation results in 0 and auto correlation results in 1 in this particular case as well. So, this way in, in this particular branch what we have seen is that the code is 4 times larger than that of the bit and hence we have 1 fourth the bit rate. Similarly, this code can also be enlarged and you have 2 other codes. So, 1 minus 1 you have 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1 expanded further with a min 1 minus 1 and min minus 1 1. So, if you do the same procedure as discussed over here, that means we multiply these two cross multiply the end result will be a 1, a 1, a minus 1 and a minus 1. If you add them up you are going to get a 0, whereas if I multiply by the same code you are going to get a 1, minus 1, minus 1 will give a plus 1, same as, as with all others you are going to get a 4 add them up divide by 4 again you are going to get a 1. So, this property is maintained. However, at this stage where your spreading factor or the code rate or the code length has become 4 times that of the original bit length that means the code has to be 4 times faster or in other words the bit rate will be 4 times slower than the chip rate. So, now you can proceed further and go to stage 3 where you have a spreading factor of 8. So, this way you can proceed further and make a variables and make many number of uh, codes which are orthogonal to each other. So, if we are in this stage and we allocate different codes to different users, let us say this is user 1, this is user 2 and so on, this is user 8. What we will easily find that if any one user's information is correlated with any other user's information, the end result would be a 0. Otherwise, when you correlate with the same user's information, you are going to get an end result of 1 whereby you can decode the data. That is first stage. The second stage now what we also have we can look at is that here uh, at, at this level uh, one can think of assigning uh, users these few code words that means there are 4 users who will be using a code length of 8 whereas here we can give to 2 users each having a code length of 4 each. That means, we now have a total of 6 users into the system whereby 2 users that means, these 2 users they will be using a code of 1 1 1 1 and the second one over here 1 1 minus 1 minus 1 and the other 4 users sorry th these will be 4 users. So, 8 is the chip length 4 users. So, they will be using the corresponding codes if I call it uh, C 5, C 6, C 7, C 8. So, there will be C 5, C 6, C 7, C 8. So, in total there will be 6 users. These users will be having 1 eighth the bit rate of the chip rate, whereas these 2 users would be having the bit rate of 1 fourth the bit rate of the chip rate. Same way what one can also do is instead of giving to 2 different users in this stage, one can think of giving this code 1 1 code to 1 user and giving these 4 different codes to 4 users. So, in that case we are going to have C 5, C 6, C 7, C 8 along with it we are going to have the code 1 1 only 
and we will not use these two. So, in that case we will find 1 and 5, 4 over here which will give us 5 users. What we will find is that this 1 1 code will remain orthogonal to these codes always, because you can check with this when 1 1 that is what we have over here, we have a 1 1 over here. This 1 1 if you multiply by the first 2, okay, if you multiply by the first 2 it will always result in a 0, because they have 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. Again if we check the, the second 2, what we are going to get 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, minus 1, 1 minus 1 and so on and so forth. So, in that manner whenever we take the second this particular users code 1 1 and we try to correlate with any other users be it C 5, C 6, C 7, C 8 it will always result in a uh, in zeros, whereas when we correlate with 1 1 it will always result in a 1. So, effectively here what we have to do is uh, in the first two chip durations this particular users code will be 1 1, the second two chip durations that users code will be again 1 1, in the third duration again this users code will be 1 1 and again in the final set that users chip will be 1 1. So, effectively the first user let us call this as the first user or u 1 in this case, it will be orthogonal with all other users. The second time interval it will again be orthogonal with all users, third time inter, inter, it will be again orthogonal to all users, fourth time interval it will again be orthogonal to all users. Now, however, if you assign this particular code which is 1 which is actually not a code to any use one user, then one will not be able to use any other codes, because all other codes are generated from the parent code. So, if we remember this structure, then we can easily generate a combination of users, whereby different users can different get different data rates. Now, why would at all one do this, because this would depend upon several factors among which the link quality is one of them. So, if the link quality is uh, very bad or is in a the situation is in heavy interference. In that case, uh, the particular user can uh, be using a larger code length. So, when one uses a larger code length, uh, one can when one is accumulating the entire energy, one is able to get some uh, bandwidth expansion gain or a spreading gain, which is also another term which can be used instead of the word uh, spreading factor, by which one can increase the signal to interference ratio or signal to noise ratio, whereby the receiver's signal strength is increased and by increasing the signal strength one is able to finally decode. So, it is kind of one can also look at it as uh, taking benefit of uh, the diversity combining. So, as we discussed in the previous uh, lecture that there are different combining strategies which are also possible when designing the receiver, but end of the day uh, where we stand is this gives us a flexibility in allowing different data rates. Even the same user can be allocated different code rates at different connections or different duration of time, whereby the user can achieve different data rates. This is one of the vital factors uh, that was introduced in 3G. Uh, however, if we look at the second generation or when we will go to the fourth or fifth generation, such facilities are not available. So, this is a unique facility and it has its own advantage, but however, uh, if we look at uh, the, the, the complexity of processing for such things, it grows tremendously as one increases the bandwidth. So, if one increases the original signal bandwidth, uh, let us say to 20 megahertz or even to 100 megahertz, this particular method of uh, receiver processing becomes uh, impossible or becomes very, very complicated, which will cause a uh, lot of other problems at the receiver. So, for other reasons as well, this got restricted uh, to use in the third generation system. And we should be open that this particular methodology has various advantages and special features which are not possible in other systems which are TDM, FDM based architecture. So, we should be open towards using the facilities and combining them towards providing newer uh, access schemes, newer multiplexing schemes and new radio access technology. Now, this spreading can be used on top of other mechanisms and at some point of time there was uh, the concept of overloading 
So, if one uses overloading mechanism that means there is already some kind of signal which is uh, going through then one can use a spreading mechanism in order to uh, put another data layer on top of whatever is existing and which will cause minimum interference to the others because these codes as, as we are seeing uh, it is generated from a pseudo random number generator pseudo noise generator. So, when it is generated through pseudo noise or if we have pretty large lengths it can appear noise like. So, in that case other signals to other other signals this would appear like noise and only to the desired signal it would appear as if there is some message content in it. So, when it now when it comes to this particular method this will see other users as noise and it can recombine its signal using the spreaded code in order to capture maximum energy. So, whereby even under heavy interference conditions uh, this can work um, in a pretty good manner. The other advantage is uh, that this can also work in an asynchronous manner which is difficult in case of uh, TDM OFDM based system. So, there is various advantages. So, it is strongly recommended that uh, if one has to actually make certain contributions towards or one has to investigate look into future generation systems one must understand the, the basic methodology uh, how these kind of uh, systems work so that that can be taken advantage of in a significant manner. Uh, moving ahead further uh, there is also possibility of uh, soft handover that means because it is a single frequency network the user equipment can simultaneously combine with more than one base stations and handover failure probabilities are significantly reduced in this case because uh, they can be assigned different codes uh, from different base stations and they would the receiver simply has to switch the code and it can translate to the next base station. The next another important thing which was introduced in this system was uh, the HARQ turbo codes was already introduced and uh, the HARQ mechanism what it does is that uh, we have already said that ARQ is a mechanism of uh, automatic repeat request, but when we talk about hybrid repeat request it can do multiple things amongst uh, several other things what it can do is uh, when you are asking for a repeat transmission that means say the receiver has uh, failed to receive a, a proper amount of data. So, what typically it does is that it rejects the data what he has what it has received and it asks for a fresh transmission. So, if the link condition is very bad then the probability that the second transmission is received correctly is also the same as the probability that the first transmission is received correctly. So, in a, if, the first if the first transmission has a very low probability of being received correctly, the second transmission also has a low probability of being received correctly. However, it is also believed because uh, of the randomness that the joint probability of receiving the signals correctly over multiple trials increases as we increase the number of trials. So, it is basically increasing the probability because they are assuming independence. Whereas, when you talk about hybrid mechanism uh, this goes in a slightly different manner that when we are transmitting the second time. So, some modifications are made in the link parameters the modifications uh, made are such that the code rate that means the FEC code rate could be reduced the modulation format could be reduced. So, for example, uh, one is a, a, one is at a certain SNR condition where the probability of error is very high under that situation if the receive packet fails that means it fails the CRC and the receiver asks for a retransmission. So, since it knows that with the previous modulation and coding rate combination so that means if the code rate is let us say half and uh, modulation is let us say uh, 16 QAM. So, that means, uh, th this would indicate 4 bits per, uh, per signal multiplied by half. So, you effectively have 2 information bits per signaling unit. So, since you know that 2 bits per signaling unit has caused an error. So, when you are asking for a retransmission one can think of reducing this 2 bits to a lower level. So, one way of achieving that would be to reduce the modulation to maybe QPSK whereby uh, per bit you will be getting per symbol you will be getting 2 bits half and you end up getting uh, 1 bit per symbol. One can also think of changing this rate half to let there be 16 quam multiplied by one third. So, that would result in 1 and one third 
bits per symbol. So, this is higher bits per symbol than this, but this is still lower than this. Okay. So, this is greater whereas, this is uh, kind of greater. So, one might choose to try this particular uh, bit rate or this particular bits per um, per resource element unit and if one finds that the probability increases, one would be successful because uh, one not only successful in receiving, but one is also more efficient because it produces more number of information bits per signaling interval. So, another way of uh, doing it is instead of simply changing uh, the, the modulation or and the code rate, one can even think of preserving the previous set of data. So, if let us say uh, there is x t or, or let us say we say x vector with underscore we indicated as a vector is received from the previous transmission and in the next transmission you are asking for another transmission with the same information that is same modulation encoded that is also possible, but you do not throw away the information which is received in the previous instance. So, this method is different. So, you have stored whatever is received and you ask for a retransmission. So, when you have received the second information, so this is uh, in the first trial and x vector that is received in the second transmission. So, by 1 we mean the first transmission and by 2 we mean the second transmission. So, then these two can be combined together. One particular way of combining could be called the MRC combining or maximal ratio combining which we will see again when we are discussing multiple antenna methods. So, there one can think of using x 1 1 1 1 indicating the first chip or the first data element of the first transmission multiplied by x. So, you can take the conjugate of it x 1 of 2. So, this 2 would go to this 2 and this 1 would go to this 1 plus x 2 of 1 multiplied by x 2 of 2 conjugate plus dot 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 up to the total length of the number of symbols that have been received. So, in other words we are saying that if you have received uh, 2 sets uh, then let k be equal to 1 to l, l is the number of symbols that were transmitted in each of the packets. From the first packet you take the kth symbol and from the second packet also you take the kth symbol, you take the conjugate, you add them together and then you finally divide it by L that is the normalizing factor and this whatever you get will be the variable which can be fed to the decision factor. So, what has happened effectively is that you have simply doubled your signal to noise ratio. That means, whatever I mean provided the signal to noise ratio has remained the same in the two transmission, the average signal to noise ratio has remained the same. So, whereby you could simply increase the signal to noise ratio and uh, since you are at now at a higher let us say the double signal to noise ratio, the probability of the packet failure decreases by a significant manner. So, we can discuss the outage probability or probability of detecting correctly when we discuss uh, MRC transmission at a later stage. So, please remember to use that same philosophy to calculate the probability of error or probability of outage or probability of packet drop if we are using the mechanism of such kind of combining techniques instead of uh, another technique where you can change the modulation and code rate. So, hereby in summary instead of simply asking for retransmission, we ask for retransmission with either change in the link parameters or at the receiver side we store the previous received signal and we combine with whatever is received afresh and the combined signal the post after combining there is a post combined signal would appear at a higher signal to noise ratio which can simply improve the probability of uh, correctly detecting the entire packet. So, these are some of the uh, important uh, mechanisms which have been introduced in the third generation system. There was also a mechanism for a fast power control at the rate of 1.5 kilohertz and there is outer loop slow uh, TPC based uh, 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 modulation turbo coded modulation based uh, block error rate me measure block error rate measurement that means when you are sending the packets then you can uh, check the block or the packet error rate and you can adjust the uh, the the uh, 
the, the thresholds for link adaptation whereas, uh, you do fast power control mechanism. Now, why is this one uh, important? This is important because uh, if you look at the signal fluctuation over time, okay, if you if you look at uh, signal fluctuation uh, over time, then this uh, under mobility conditions that means, when one is moving at uh, high velocity, we have discussed this that the signal fluctuates significantly. Okay. So, if the signal fluctuates uh, significantly, then there are two kinds of things that happen. That means, uh, one can expect that as the distance increases, if we talk about distance, the average signal strength decreases. However, if we look at the small duration of time, let us say in orders of seconds or half a second, within that period the distance that is effectively covered is very, very small it may be a few meters. Now, within that few meters, the average received signal strength usually remains constant. Now, if within that period, the average received signal strength has uh, remained constant. However, because of the mobility, because of the multipath, we had uh, drawn the uh, picture of a multipath scenario. So, so one can uh, take a look at this picture and just imagine that the receiver has moved a few meters, maybe one meter to 2 meter distance, not even that. Within that, each of these paths are going to change. So, these are positions of reflection, diffraction and scattering. So, obviously, when the receiver has moved from that point to a new point, this path length has become different. So, we can take a, a different color in order to indicate that. So, this path length will be different. Okay. So, this path length will be different. So, this is the path length and uh, this point would also come from a different point that means, the reflection point would be different. So, similarly this would also come reflected from another point. So, if all the path lengths have changed the way these signals would combine at this location compared to the way the, the signal would have combined when the receiver was here is completely different. So, this combination keeps on happening as the user moves from one location to the to another at every instant of time. So, when the user is moving from here and it is slowly going towards this direction at every physical point these kind of combinations are happening and which are changing at every instant. Now, because of such a change what we will find is that the signal strength fluctuates over time in a short distance of 1 to 2 meters which is also termed as small scale fading. Now, if you look at the chip duration it is 3.84 mega chips per second effectively indicating that the chip duration is very, very short in order of milliseconds. So, when it is very, very short in, in within that duration that means, when the vehicle is moving from one point to another the signal strength fluctuates heavily to the order of 30 to 40 dB because of small scale fading. We will discuss briefly about a little bit more details uh, when we go into the multipath propagation and, and MIMO before we understand any other, other things in future. So, in order to maintain the same level of average received signal strength over the short distance because if that is not done these these chips that we are talking about and the orthogonality that we have discussed or or the correlation properties uh, that we have mentioned earlier over here that instead of 1 0 it can be high correlation or, or low correlation uh, what would happen is that these properties would simply change one can think of that uh, some of the chips are getting a high gain let's say a1 another chip gets a low gain a2 another gets a different gain a3 because of fast fading conditions so this orthogonality property gets destroyed and the entire design uh, which was based on orthogonality or high auto correlation and low cross correlation gets destroyed. To avoid that during the entire symbol duration of the entire code, it is desired that the uh, signal level remains constant. So, in order to do that a fast power control 
can help in a significant manner in maintaining the performance of the system, in maintaining the quality of service and so on and so forth. Along with this, uh, there is uh, the outer loop slow control, which was also adjust the SNR switching thresholds based on which one can uh, modify the, the code rates, one can modify the modulation order and one can uh, even do other adaptations also. So, with this uh, we, we, we will stop the discussion on the waveform for third generation and from the next lecture onwards we will discuss the foundation of multi carrier especially OFTM which is the base for the fourth generation system as well as for the fifth generation system. So, uh, it is, it is um, a, an advice that one goes through the details of this particular method because we will not discuss this in, in uh, any details uh, further beyond this thing. However, uh, this is very important many interesting methodologies have been uh, have developed because of these uh, WCDMA systems and uh, we should understand that we can take advantage of these things in few design of future generation systems. And just a short note that at some point of time there were lot of proposals which combined multi carrier systems plus spread spectrum systems. And uh, many schemes like multi carrier CDMA, multi tone CDMA and many others were developed which combined the benefits of both the different systems. So, there are uh, several literature available. So, one should feel free to get into the details of them to, to understand how the different special properties of the different schemes were combined together to come up with a newer waveform architecture which would meet the demands or the or, or would have properties uh, which are very special and can be designed in a way which can meet very special requirements. So, thank you for this particular lecture, we will meet again in the next lecture.